Hi, my name is Amanda, and honestly, I'm just trying my best. This is my podcast where I talk about whatever I want to talk about because I'm still kind of figuring out, and I think that's okay. If you want to tune in and come along for the ride, I'd love to have you. You are now listening to Semi-Mindful Dance. Welcome to Semi-Mindful Banter. I'm Amanda Doyle, and my favorite color is salmon pink. This is a podcast where I don't really know what I'm doing, but I do it anyways, and I hope you enjoy it. It's just me on my own today, but I'll be introducing some segments today that are going to be a regular part of the show, so I hope that you enjoy these new segments that I've created for you. We'll go into them as we progress. Here's a few updates on my week. Um, I started messing around with Unity, the video game maker, because I found it that it's actually free to use it. So I started messing around with it and I was able to make a dog's tail wag. So I'm pretty impressed with myself. I really do want to make a video game one day. I think that would be so fun. And I think it's just like a great use of all my talents. Um, so yeah, that's just a dream of mine. And I guess downloading Unity and getting started in it and starting to learn how it works is a way of getting there. I visited my mom recently and I had a great time. I went to her house because I had a doctor's appointment the next day, but I was able to spend the night with her and it was Mother's Day. So we went out for dinner. We went to Montana's and then we went back to her house and watched Bad Girls Club. See, I get everyone in my life to watch Bad Girls Club. That's just the way that it works. I don't know about her, but I had a great time and I assume she had a great time. We just hung out and watched the show. We also watched this really stupid movie. And by the time, like, it was just so stupid that you couldn't turn it off. You know, you just had to see what happened. And also half of the beginning was like softcore porn, like basically shots of the girls' asses the whole time. Speaking of family, one of my sisters, my stepsister, is stopping in my town in August when she comes to the province, and I'm super excited. And uh, she's never met my partner, Patrick, so I'm excited for them to meet, and I'm also going to see my nephews. That's all I've got to say. Let's jump right into the episode. Our first segment is called Purpose in Pop Culture. Basically, in Purpose in Pop Culture, we analyze how pop culture stories show the discovery of purpose. So basically, how do video games, movies, TV shows, books show how people find their purpose in life? I've always been interested in purpose. I feel like I've always had a hard time finding what my purpose is. So it helps me to analyze other people's purposes. I actually have my life coaching background in life purpose. That was the thing that I decided to study when I got my life coaching certificate. I can say I can motivate the hell out of you. That's for sure. Today we're in today in purpose in pop culture. We're going to talk about the hero's journey in video games. The hero's journey is called a monomyth. It's a narrative structure that outlines the typical adventure of the archetypal hero in the story. It was identified by Joseph Campbell, and it has stages that help shape the hero's growth and overall story arc. We're going to go over four main stages for each of the video games that we analyze today. Like I said, the monomyth is the hero's journey, but it's also the hero adventuring from the real world into a realm of adventure, facing and overcoming trials and returning transformed. There are four stages to the monomyth. Stage one is the call to adventure. The character is invited to leave the familiar world and embark on a journey. For our first example, we're going to use Grand Theft Auto V and we're going to use Michael's story. If you're not familiar, Grand Theft Auto V is about going into the criminal world and making a name for yourself there. There's three main characters, Michael, Franklin, and Trevor. Michael is the family man. He feels unfulfilled in witness protection, and he longs for the thrill of his criminal past. 
That's why he's in witness protection because of his criminal past, but he longs for that again because it was exciting. Stage two is the mentor. This is someone who provides guidance, advice, or magical aid to help the hero. Essentially, they prepare the hero for the main battle. In Grand Theft Auto, Michael's mentor is Lester Crest. He's a computer genius that Michael knew back in the day, and he encourages Michael to rejoin the criminal world and aids him in preparing for the heist that he completes. Stage three is trials and challenges. This is basically a series of tests, enemies, challenges that help the hero grow stronger and prove their abilities. It is crucial for the character development. In Grand Theft Auto, Michael's trials and challenges are stuff like planning and executing complex heists, dealing with his family conflict, and even navigating the dangerous criminal underworld. Stage four is the ultimate boon, also known as the ultimate goal. It's when the hero achieves a goal or obtains significant reward after overcoming the main challenge. In Grand Theft Auto, Michael's ultimate boon is successfully completing the final heist because it brings him financial gain and accomplishment. This is also an opportunity for redemption and reconciliation with his family. Now let's see these four stages in a few other video games that don't have the traditional hero's journey. Grand Theft Auto V doesn't really have the traditional hero's journey either, but I don't play a lot of those traditional games with the hero's journey, like um, The Legend of Zelda, Kingdom Hearts, games that have a basic hero going on a journey. But you can find these four stages in any video game because these four stages are crucial for making any good storyline. In Animal Crossing New Horizons, the call to adventure is moving to the deserted island. Your mentors are Tom Nook and Isabel. Your trials and challenges are building the island, managing your resources, and managing social interactions. And your ultimate boon is building a thriving and personalized island community. Even in the Sim series, there's the four stages. So your call to adventure is starting a new life with a new Sim. There's re not really a mentor. You could count in-game tutorials and user experience. The trials and challenges are managing the needs, relationships, careers, and personal goals of your sim and the sims around them. And then the ultimate boon is achieving lifetime aspirations and creating generational legacies. Finally, Stardew Valley. Call to Adventure is moving to Stardew to restore the family farm. Your mentor is mainly Lewis, but also others like Robin and the wizard. Your trials and challenges are dealing with your farm, managing your relationships and exploring things like the mines and unlocking other parts of the world to explore. And your ultimate boon in the end is creating a successful farm and integrating fully into the community. Like I said, a video game can't really have a narrative without these four stages. Our second segment is called Philosophical Psychology. This is where we philosophically look at psychological themes in popular culture. Today, we're talking about existential themes in reality TV. First, let's talk authenticity, especially in dating shows like Love is Blind, Married at First Sight, The Ultimatum. These dating shows are about building relationships, but can you actually build an authentic relationship based on the personas that someone puts on in order to make a TV show? You're not your real self when you're making a TV show. When you're on a reality TV show, you're getting fed a lot of information and you're also being heavily influenced. You may even be in a worse state of mind because a lot of the times these environment on these shows will feed you lots of alcohol and then not feed you enough food. So you're drunk and you're exhausted from working long hours and filming long hours. And can you build authentic, thriving, stable relationships from these TV personas? If I got to know someone, I don't think it would work because when you get back to the real world, you become the different person, the person that you actually are in your real life. You can't, I think it's very hard to meet and establish a relationship with someone in a situation that's not like the real world. Because once you go back to the real world, everything's going to change. And then we talk about freedom with shows like Big Brother and Survivor. These people are giving up their freedom for a chance at fame and fortune. So it begs the question, which is more valuable? Is fame and fortune more valuable or is freedom more valuable? 
because these people are willingly giving up their freedom. Big Brother, you are videotapes 24 hours a day. You have no freedom. In Survivor, you also don't have much freedom. Shows like that, they're giving up all this just for a chance at fame and fortune. There's not even, um, there's not even a confirmation that they're going to go anywhere. And if they do become famous and have fortune, there's no guarantee either that they're going to have freedom. Essentially, once you make a choice to come onto these shows, you are giving up your freedom for the rest of your life. There's no guarantee that it's going to come back. You're giving up your anonymity. And then let's talk about choice. So shows like Vanderpump Rules and The Real Housewives, these shows are centered around personal choices. But we know that a lot of these choices aren't real. These choices are choices that are fed to the people by the producers and choices that are influenced by things that are going on in the reality world. And that's not necessarily the real world. We also have shows like The Circle, which emphasizes the consequences of how you portray yourself. That show is literally all about how you portray yourself and every choice you make has an impact on how people see you. And the size of the circle makes a difference. So it's like the size of the room. If you're in a circle with 20 people, which is basically being in a room with 20 people, you might not get hurt as much. You might not get as many chances to speak. But if you're in a room with 10 people, then you have more chances to speak and your voice is a little bit louder. Especially if you're in a room with five people, you have way more chances to speak and your voice is way louder. People can hear you a lot better and a lot clearer. Because these circles are so small, the choices that these people make really affect their game and really show consequences. The consequences are magnified. And we watch these shows and we find the challenging of these norms entertaining. So does that mean we're done with the status quo? Are we just ready to move on and start this whole new world? Because I'd love to do that. There's a lot of wrong in this world that I'd love to fix. And I feel like if we could move on to something better, that would be better. Our next segment only really has a working title for now. It's Tarot Readings for Characters. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a tarot reading for a character at the beginning of their journey. A character from a movie, a TV show, a book, anything like that. I'm going to analyze their tarot reading from the beginning of their journey and then compare it to what actually happens in their story. Really see if this tarot reading is a hit or a miss. So just so you know, I'm doing live tarot right now. This is a live tarot reading. These cards were not previously pulled. This is straight from the source. The movie we're going to analyze today is Pitch Perfect, and we're going to talk about Becca, the main character's journey. Becca is played by Anna Kendrick. Basically, the start of her journey is that she's a rebellious college freshman that reluctantly joins her school's all-girls a cappella group. I'm going to start pulling cards for her, and we're going to connect it to the film and how certain things happen if they do happen like that. First, I'm pulling for Becca's situation. The first three cards we have for Becca for her situation at the beginning of the movie is Judgment Reversed, Seven of Pentacles Reversed, and Six of Swords Horizontal. We're going to go through those cards one by one. Judgment Reversed talks about it's time to take evaluation of your life and look at what you could be doing better. Becca needs to look at what she's doing in her life and see how she could be making things better. At the beginning of the movie, she's not really down to go to her college classes or really try. And the universe is begging her to take some judgment into her hands and look at her life and assess where she's going. We also have the Seven of Pentacles reversed, which talks about the opposite of perseverance. Becca is not persevering right now, and she is... She is frustrated and impatient regarding the fruits of her labor. So she does all this work with her DJing and she wants to be a DJ, but she feels like it's not really going anywhere. She feels like she's going to be stuck here forever, just being a wannabe DJ for the rest of her life. Finally, the Six of Swords horizontal goes into the fact that Becca is stuck halfway between transition. She is not all the way into becoming a new person yet and she's not all the way and in, into her old self she's halfway there she's kind of 
wavering between the two, her old life and her new life, and not really sure which one to pick. She's in a very transitional period. Next, I'm going to pull for Becca's action. What actions that the cards suggest she would take at the beginning of this journey in order to result in the best outcome. We'll see how these actions tie in with what actually happens with Becca. The first card we have is the Queen of Cups reversed, and I think that ties into Becca having to have a little bit more emotional awareness for what's going on around her. She is very closed off when she joins the acapella group. She immediately butts heads with Aubrey, the leader of the group. And when Jesse, a member of the Troublemakers, is trying to romance her, she is very closed off towards him and even to making any friends, such as Fat Amy or Brittany Snow's character, Chloe. A good action for Becca to take would be to open herself up a little bit and become a little bit more emotionally aware of her own emotions and also the emotions of the people around her. I feel like by the end of the movie, she does end up doing that. The next card we have in the action state is the moon. And I think in this sense, we're talking about creativity and expression. Becca has to use this chance of the acapella group at, to express herself and to express her creativity. And she is frustrated at the beginning because she is not able to express her creativity in the way she wants to. They're doing a lot of basic stuff that she's not really they're doing the same songs and they're, she's just bored however once aubrey allows her to start making mixes for the groups to sing to that gives her a creative outlet and she starts to feel more aligned and she starts to feel more in alignment with what she's actually meant to be doing like we said at the beginning she was feeling impatient with where her career was going and doing this hobby in this hobby group allows her to expand on her chosen career. This one's an interesting card. In the action state, we see the tower in the horizontal position. And for me, that talks about how Becca is going into a period where, like we said, she's halfway between, but she, this is also going to be a very rocky period of transition for her because she's trying to avoid the transition. There's changes that need to be made to her life. Becca's resisting the changes that need to come into her life. And that means letting down her guard and having her emotional awareness and following her creative dreams. But she is very resistant to all these changes and she's resistant to the people that wanna come into her life and the things that need to happen to her. Our last card in the action row is the King of Wands reversed. And this talks about how Becca struggles with letting go of control and letting go of being the leader. Becca wants to be the leader because she is a very independent person and independent people like to lead because they are used to it just being them. Independent people are used to leading themselves, so they think they know how to effectively lead others too. I can admit I'm guilty of that. The King of Wands reverse can also talk about being impatient or arrogant, and there's definitely a lot of moments of impatience and arrogance for Becca in the movie. She, like I said at the beginning, she clashes with Aubrey because she doesn't want to give up control. She clashes with several other people throughout the movie. She clashes major with Jesse, the guy who likes her, because she's not willing to let her guard down. He helps her and she gets mad at him because she says, well, I didn't need any help. And that's not fair because he was just trying to help you. So this King of Wands reverse is definitely talking about how Becca needs to let go of the attitude and just accept what people are trying to give to her. Finally, we're pulling for Becca's outcome. For Becca's action, we have our first card is the Five of Swords reversed. And this talks about how Beck is ready to move on and reconcile at the end of the movie. And she's ready to fix her relationships, fix the problems within herself, and move on to something bigger and better. She does do that. She moves on to, in the other movies, we see her continuing to work with the acapella group. And she's able to win. And she's able to make it to the finals and win. I'm pretty sure they win in the end. We also have the hermit and I think that talks about how we we just talked about how Becca is an independent person and she likes to make her own decisions but she can't be afraid to look to herself for answers. I feel like Becca looks in the movie to a lot of different people for what the right decision should be even if she doesn't realizing it. She's subconsciously depending on other people 
And I feel like the hermit would be a, a step in the right direction of her becoming more independent. And she does at the end of the movie, she becomes a lot more able to become a healthy independent person because there is a difference between a healthy independent person and a person who is closed off and independent. And the person who is closed off and independent is independent, but they also are very closed off and they don't let you see into their life. The healthy independent is able to make good choices, but also keep people in their life and maintain healthy boundaries. Finally, we have the Four of Swords reversed. That talks about a need for that talks about a need for a break and resisting it. So I don't know if that really ties in with the end of the movie there because Becca ends up, they do get a break and I don't think she really resists it. It's the end of the season, so they move on, but they, we don't really see any clues of her resisting the break that she's going on. And in the next movie, we don't really see any clues of that either. I think in one of the movies, she talks about needing a break, but that's just a normal storyline that happens in life. So that last card isn't so spot on, but everything else pretty much was. Everything else pretty much matched with Becca's storyline. I was able to find things in the reading that match to things in Becca's life and what actually happened in the movie. There's a lot of themes of self-reflection and becoming the person that you always wanted to be and a lot of themes of working on yourself. I think that could be one of the points of Pitch Perfect is that you have to become a better version of yourself if you want to make yourself work the best in a group. I'm going to pull a few charms for Becca to see what we have. Remember, these are charms for her at the beginning of her journey. We have a seahorse. Time to see past all of the bullshit and tune into your intuition. Trust your instincts and inner guidance. Cut through the noise and distractions and tune into your intuition to make wise decisions. That's the second time intuition was kind of mentioned in this reading, and I'm not sure where that ties in with Pitch Perfect because Maybe it's saying that Becca's intuition is leading her to joining the acapella group, but her rebellion side doesn't want her to. Alice in Wonderland Rabbit, are you only following the orders that have been given to you? Take a moment to reflect on whether you are living your life based on others' expectations or if you're making choices that align with your own desires and values. I think Becca's problem is kind of the opposite. She has to find a balance between the two and she's more so leaning on the side where she's making choices that align with her own desires and values. She went to college for her dad, but she's, is she trying at the beginning? No. And we have a dragonfly. Now may be the time for you to connect to a higher power. Open yourself up to spiritual guidance and connection. Pay attention to synchronicities and signs from the universe that may be guiding you towards a deeper spiritual path. There is not much of a spiritual theme in Pitch Perfect. It is... A mainstream movie so there's not going to be much of a spiritual theme but i think a lot of us can connect to a higher power through music and maybe that's becca's way of connecting to something that's bigger than her is through her music and through her creative expression our fourth and final segment is organization tips this one's going to be more of an app spotlight on the app habitica i've talked about it before on my podcast but I really like it because it's an app that lets you gain points and level up for completing the tasks in your life. So I struggle a lot with staying motivated to do the things that I need to get done in my life, especially normal stuff. You know what I mean? Like doing the dishes, cleaning my hamster's cage. But having this app allow you to level up when you do something motivates you to get stuff done. You want to get the points and you want to get to the highest level and you want to say that you've achieved this much. There's also a section of the app that I don't really use, but it allows you to use the reward points that you've collected to cash them in for different rewards in your life. Um, or there's an avatar in the game that we're going to talk about in a second that you can customize in ma making their armor and their weapons. You also have the health bar and that motivates you to get shit done because when you lose, like when you don't get shit done, you don't get your dailies done, you lose health. And if you don't level up in time, then you're going to lose health and you're going to die. It also helps me to stay accountable because I have a party on there with like five people and we complete quests together. We fight bosses together. And when I forget my dailies and I lose health, it affects my party and it affects how they're getting their quests done and how we're not getting quests done together. If I put in more points, then we're getting our quests done together. Helps me stay accountable. 
There's customization from daily tasks to regular habits to one-time goals. You can even track your progress by making steps for you to complete an app and marking off those one by one. You can customize your avatar. Like I said, you can buy rewards to either make them customizable to your life, like watching a movie, eating a snack, or you can buy rewards that are in the app that have to do with customizing your avatar or even having a little pet to be in your avatar. I have difficulty with motivation, so Habitica really helps me to get my stuff done because I am motivated more to get the points and my morning routine has become easier. I'm motivated more to stay accountable with my party. I have an easier time getting started with my tasks because I know I have to get them done in order to make sure my party doesn't lose points. And there's definitely room for improvement. There always is room for improvement. But I like it because it helps me work on becoming more organized and becoming more productive and gamifying the process a bit. All right. So that's it from me. That's the end of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it today and enjoy our new segments. If you have suggestions for what you want me to talk about, we have four segments, purpose and pop culture, philosophical psychology, tarot readings for characters, and organization tips. Maybe there's some specific type of organization you want me to talk about. Maybe there's a character that you want me to give a tarot reading for. I'm down to do whatever. Let me know. You can catch up with me on social media, on Instagram, and threads, and YouTube under The Amanda Influence. I've also created an Instagram for my dog. So if you want to follow her, it's Josie Wants Snacks. And then you can follow me on Tumblr, wantingtomakeart.tumblr.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you had a great time because I had a good time too. And we'll talk next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to Semi Mindful Banter. This podcast was created and produced by me, Amanda Doyle. And our theme music will be linked in the show notes. Again, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.